everyone. This is Dr. Whitney, Dr. Mom ND, joining you for another Wellness Wednesday. And I'm going to be honest, this one is going to be interesting. And I'm a little late again because I tell you what, there is just so much information. I am spending at least a couple of hours every day trying to keep on top of all of the new information because this situation is just ever evolving. And I don't just mean the newly um, confirmed cases or the rates or the percentages or the tracking or anything like that. I mean the process of getting information out there and what's being considered legitimate, what's being promoted, what's being um, sort of pushed away out of the public eye. And so that's why I have such a generic title on today's video as well as a very generic description in the video. Um, one of the main things I wanted to say to start was that um, I wanted to keep this concise, but there's just so much information. I think it's going to end up being long. So just fair warning. I don't know how long. I literally my goal is going to try to make this 15 to 20 minutes, but I think it's it's going to be much longer. Just because again, I think there are aspects of this that if people are fully understanding how this thing is getting in, how it's replicating, and how the natural things we're talking about affect that, you have a better understanding of how important they could be to you in a pitch. So we'll kind of leave it at that. But um, the sort of overarching theme of today is um, being on par with several things. One is not just my professional um, associations and groups, um, but what's happening online is that any natural remedy type posts are being either downgraded or removed by Facebook or other online social media. So anybody out there putting up videos, putting up posts, sharing articles, um, anything that's natural and not evidence-based is being downgraded. So again, in my post today, you're going to see I am not going to say the C word, uh, or I'm going to try not to. I'm not even going to try to say the V word, um, virus. <laughs> um, or even as much as possible, limit me saying anything regarding the immune system, because now even stuff that's um, immune boosting or immune strengthening is being targeted, uh, because it's again being seen as um, pervading natural unproven remedies, which makes it unsafe. So any use of pound or hashtag um, CV or CV19, anything like that is immediately putting our posts on the bottom of the hashtag searches. Um, they're being put down there over um, associations like the CDC and the WHO. So anybody who has a natural post and tags the CV right now, um, their post automatically goes to the bottom because the online algorithms say, that's not qualified, we're doing the CDC and the WHO first. So I'm not going to do anything like that as much as possible so that this post stays in the top of people's threads so that you can share it and it stays in the top of your thread and other people's thread. Um, I think this information is really important to be shared far and wide because not only are people entitled to the whole story, and I'm not saying that there's fake news out there or that this is in any way, you know, a conspiracy of sorts. I don't even want to go there. I'm just saying that what you're hearing is there's education behind it, that if you had the education, you would have a better understanding and less fear and less panic surrounding this because I think what's being cherry picked and being presented to people can be very fearful. So again, it is serious. We are taking it seriously, obviously, but I think there's a lot of information. Um, people, we're, we're not stupid. Like people want to understand things. Like we're not lemmings. We can handle information. We can handle science. Um, and I feel like when I empower my patients with education and not just um, lectures on do this because I said so. I like to explain things and I like to explain it in a way that the patient feels empowered with the education and the knowledge and the tools to have a vested interest in what I am asking or recommending that they do for themselves. Um, 
they don't have that, the likelihood of them being compliant with what we're recommending or with our plan just goes down the toilet. So, um, as I said, all natural p practitioners right now, our stuff is being downgraded, buried, whatever, online. Um, within my own groups, I have been advised not to make claims of cure, treat, or prevent, okay? Um, we kind of already knew that just with the arena that naturopathic doctors find themselves in. Um, and so I try not to say stuff like that, period. I, I really try not to. Um, but now we're being told to not even say anything about supporting your immune system. Okay, I said it. Um, why? Really? I don't know. We are in the thick of something that hasn't been seen since the 1918 Spanish flu. And why wouldn't people want to consider every available option? I mean, conventional medicine is rushing through a B uh, development and treating people with off-label medications such as rheumatoid arthritis medicines. And now we're finally getting the recommendations to not even use things like ibuprofen and Tylenol um, because they're either triggering the symptoms or making them far worse. So, you know, the only things being talked about, and I've heard, I've heard arguments to not call it the media, but what's being presented on the news shows, what's being presented on the news outlets, um, articles, and social media, platforms is only about conventional medicine. Nobody's talking about anything natural. And natural stuff has been around for thousands of years, really. I mean, this is what my whole education was based on. I went to a federally accredited school. This was the, you know, topics of therapies that we were taught um, and how we practice every day. And so our clinical results, I think, speak for themselves. Um, one note on that is you know all of this rush to drugs and v's as the only um possible resolution to this whole situation um is kind of baffling to me honestly because um modern medicine was only organized just 100 years ago so that's a whole other topic but google the flexner report so the american medical association um organized what we know as modern medicine just 100 years ago in 1920. That's when the Flexner Report came out. So they then decided what constituted a medical doctor, what their education had to be, what their training had to be, what um, diagnostic therapeutics they were able to use, and it derived the entire modern medical system, which we now know as um, designating a diagnosis, which then dictates the treatment, a drug or surgery, whatever. So. Um, you know, I'm not out there making outrageous claims like, um, this is my example I thought of, it's kind of silly. I'm not telling you to put dill pickle slices on your eyes and sleep that way, right? No. Um, so the other thing we've been told is if you're not talking about something evidence-based, um, then don't post it. If you don't have an article to back it up as evidence-based medicine, don't post it. It has to be a legitimate source. So pretty much everything today, one of the reasons it took me so long is I literally went through and had to find on PubMed an article for every single botanical that I'm going to talk about in so much as what it's been studied and what potential uses it's been found. So I'm going to post as soon as I can type up like a resources or bibliography sheet or maybe just copy the links into the comments when I get a chance. But I think I've got about 10 to 15 different studies from PubMed that's going to be resources for each one of these points. So hopefully that's enough to garner this as being evidence-based um, information. We'll just say that. Uh, so this, and, and the reason for that is, the reason I struggle with that is, again, natural remedies have been around for thousands of years, plants. Um, Evidence-based medicine in theory is fantastic, right? They want there to have been a study that provides evidence that a therapy is clinically beneficial, that it has a significant clinical impact, okay? And that's great in theory, but that same system has also brought us drugs like Vioxx and tons of other dangerous medications that had big recalls, right? So the system is not foolproof, and I'm not picking on them because obviously they do probably hopefully hopefully they have the best intentions um but here's here's the reality St these studies and evidence-based medicine the, the studies that provide the evidence base cost millions of dollars and the only people with money to do that are drug companies and they do that because they stand to make a profit the problem is natural remedies 
um, can't be patented. Things that occur in nature cannot be patented. So drug companies and scientists and researchers, they take something in nature like red yeast rice and they figure out what is the most bio active biological compound in there and then they recreate that in the lab and voila, you have statin drugs. So that's a whole other story, but if you didn't know, um, once statin drugs were created, Everything in the world was done to bury red yeast rice um, and get everyone on statins instead. And, oh, if that didn't work, well, then there's no evidence to prove that red yeast rice is effective. Um, so I kind of feel like it's a, it's a hollow argument sometimes um, because, A, who's, where is the evidence coming from? Who is paying for it? And just because there's not evidence, does it really mean it doesn't work? We see that natural medicine works every day. So... Um, yeah, I talked about I'm going to try to have a resource from PubMed for everything I talk about today. Um, and on one last note before we get into all of that, um, in terms of talking about evidence-based medicine and conventional medicine, anti-V drugs or treatments are not actually anti-V in the sense that antibiotics kill bacteria. So this is another important thing for people to understand. Um, when we are trying to work on the body's response to a V infection, what we are actually trying to do is manipulate one of several mechanisms, either how the V, <laughs> this is going to be fun, right? It's like a game, um, is attaching to the body, how it is permeating the cells, and or how it is replicating is one of several ways that I'll talk about. Um, and there are lots of natural ways to do that. There are also a couple, a couple of drugs. And when you really get into the nuts and bolts of it, you'll understand why there are some things like rheumatoid arthritis drugs right now that are being used as an off-label use to inhibit certain inflammatory receptors of the body because those are the ones that are so highly um, elevated and thus dangerous in these current infections. So, um, this is also why these types of infections are generally self-limiting. So bacterial infections, we actually have to kill the bug. All right, I'll say it one more time. Viral infections tend to be self-limiting because they get themselves into our cells and they replicate. So it's not totally preventable or killable in that sense. What we're doing is trying to strengthen our body's responses that it would have and manipulate that um, infection's ability to get in and use our cells against us. So I'm going to get to a lot of that when we talk about the whole cytokine um, storm. Okay, so today, obviously, this is a very different approach, um, talking about the immune system. Shh, don't say it too loud. Um, and yet, to cover all the aspects legally, I am still going to preface this presentation with the following disclaimer. These statements have not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration. These products are not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease, nor should any of these recommendations replace the advice of your doctor. Though I do hold a Minnesota registration license uh, for a naturopathic doctor, I practice in Wisconsin, which is unlicensed, so I need, need to further toe that line as well. So as such, I am also not giving you medical advice. This is an educational-based presentation and it contains information that should not replace the advice of your doctor even though conventional doctors don't have any education whatsoever about botanical medicine <sighs> okay so we got that out of the way all right so let's talk about the one big thing that's probably going to take up most of the time today cytokine storms so i had to dig deep in this i read so much research i went back to all my textbooks if you don't believe me here's a pile of four different medical and immunological textbooks from school just to go back and refresh myself with the, again, nuts and bolts of this, it gets very tiny. There is a reason immunologists and virologists um, do such detailed work. It's because there are so many moving pieces. So this whole all started because I saw a lot of threads online about people concerned about using elderberry syrup. Um, some saying that it seemed like it made symptoms worse, and then people started talking about cytokine storms. So I thought I would provide a little education on that because, uh, again, I think it's important to understand what is being stimulated in your body uh, by certain 
uh, natural products and if that could potentially lead to something more serious if you are in fact trying to treat yourself naturally. So this is in general a grand oversimplification, but um, basically different V's, different little naughty guys, they have different ways of getting in and binding to different cells in our body. Each V has its own unique cell that it likes to target. Um, and because of that, different messengers of the immune system, which are cytokines and chemokines, are triggered. So these little guys are responsible for the inflammation that happens in our body. So um, you can kind of think of them as inflammatory molecules. Um, and remember that generally their job is to help you. It's good. So when you get an acute injury, when you have a cut um, or an infection of a cut, their job is to come to that area. And what inflammation is, is the swelling and the redness that is created when cells from your immune system rush to the site to try to help you clean up and heal. And so that can be good. But in a V infection, um, it creates an elevated response with this feedback loop that just keeps making it higher and higher. And ultimately, as we've talked about with food, chronic inflammation becomes very dangerous very quickly. So different messengers mean different inflammatory responses, which there can be good ones and bad ones, different feedbacks and different systems, which ultimately then target different organs. Um, and especially in respiratory V infections, these often revolve around the cells in the lung. Duh. Okay, so initially a lot of this was very outlined um, about the flu because we just simply know more about the flu, okay? But the process is the same. So I'm going to share it and then get to the more specific part about Mr. C, V, which we're not saying today either. So generally cytokines create conditions that bacteria and V find very difficult to survive in, which we just talked about. So when you have a small cut or an infection of a cut, this is how they're helping us. However, many Vs have figured out how to use our system against us. So their way into our body now is to bind to these immune cells. So one way they do this, and again, this isn't necessarily super specific to the C, V, which is happening right now, um, but it is one of the main ways that these come into our body <laughs> um, is hemagglutinin, which is like a glue. So this is one of the ways they attach to us, okay? Um, they use this substance, um, the flu ones anyways, to bind to sialic linkages on airway cells. This is their little specific site, okay? So one way that you can address the flu naturally then is to use a hemagglutinin inhibitor, right? Because it would prevent the V from binding to the sialic linkage, at least in the flu. So one of two herbals that do that are Chinese skullcap and ginger. Uh, the Vs also alter the permeability of our cells so that they can get inside and replicate. So using something like a neuraminidase or a silidase enzyme, um, they use that enzyme to make our cell more permeable, to break in, basically. It's like a key to the door for them. This is why, in the flu at least, we have neuraminidase inhibiting drugs. That's what Tamiflu is, or astaltamivir is the generic name. It, stop, it inhibits the little key that the virus is using oh, shit, I said it, to get in. Um, this is harder than it seems. Okay, so again, there are natural herbs that have this same action, neuraminidase inhibiting. Uh, Chinese skullcap, elder flower from what I can find. It's an elderberry, but maybe elderberry has some of the same properties. It's, it's tough to find all of this information right now. Um, accurate anyways. And many authors kept referring to elder. And when I looked at elder, it was most often flower, not necessarily elderberry, though elderberry is the one everybody associates with the flu. So uh, licorice, rhodiola, ginger, and quercetin. These were all shown to be neuromidase inhibiting activity against A and B strains of the, the yeah, flu V. <laughs> Um, if you're just joining me, I am not saying the C word today or the V word. I'm like signing or whatever, but I'm trying to keep my post from getting blocked by the online bot. So, um, it's a fun little game. Uh, so further going through the process, the, once the V has infiltrated the cell, it goes through another process to sort of create its own little 
room in the house, if you will. So it seals off a little area just for itself, and then it creates this little channel where it gets food in and junk out. And that's called an M2 ion channel. Now this I know for sure is unique to the influenza because there is only one um, M2 inhibitor that stops it, which is Lomation. And that's specific to influenza A. So not sure about the CV going on right now, but again, I'm just sharing, these are the ways in which we know the steps that the V takes in getting into our body and replicating and the steps then at which we can intervene and try to stop it, limit it, whatever. So once it's got its little room, the V then takes itself apart into pieces of RNA and DNA, or sorry, RNA and proteins to start replicating. So it like makes new pieces of itself. Chinese skull cap inhibits RNA release. So there's another step. Then it goes through the whole process of replication, budding and shedding, and the cell dies. Because as it grows new pieces, the, the cell swells and then it bursts and then all those new pieces are released and they go out and they attach to new cells and the thing proliferate. So obviously this entire process then of swelling the cell causes extreme inflammation. This can result in edema in the lungs and pneumonia. So throughout this process, what is ultimately happening behind the scenes then is that cytokines are stimulated. So again, these are those little inflammatory messengers and there are specific cells in our body that identify things that shouldn't be there, right? Uh, microbes and start the release of these cytokines. So um, NF-kappa-beta is the one um, cell that really starts the whole cascade, okay? So it starts the feedback that makes, as we talked about, the cells more permeable, the V's like that, but the body is doing that because it's, it's trying to let more of our immune cells in to deal with it, but at the same time, the V takes advantage of that and also gets into more cells. So it's sort of like one step forward and two steps back. Once you start this feedback, more and more receptors and messengers are released. So the most highly inflammatory one is interferon gamma. It's a type 2 interferon, also called a macrophage activating factor. This causes severe overinflammation, um, it, it, which is what is seen in severe cases of the flu. So by stimulating this, the virus creates a positive, I said, I said the V word, creates a positive feedback that leads to what is ultimately what people are concerned about, the cytokine storm. So it's not the initial cascade per se, it's when the symptoms set in and things become severe. Then you could be potentially setting yourself up for the cytokine storm. Now, what is that? Some other parts to the puzzle. Tumor necrosis factor alpha creates your white blood cells to move. It, it says, hey, we got a problem, you need to come deal with it. The problem is, is that with everything going on, all of those white blood cells basically just become mucus in the lungs. So they clog up the lymph nodes there, and that's where a lot of the fluid and the swelling um, becomes an issue because your lungs need all that space for air. So the more you fill it up with white blood cells and mucus and clog up the lymph nodes in there, the less, space, less and less space you're getting for air to, to breathe. So red root, pleurisy root, and immortal support the lungs the limbs and limb structures in the lungs as well as the spleen so again it's not necessarily about attacking the v or doing anything to the v specifically but rather supporting the structures that are affected by it okay so it's like the secondary effects what's happening how do we keep that stuff from sort of shutting down basically now Ultimately, what it gets narrowed down to is that tumor necrosis factor alpha, interleukin-1 beta, interleukin-6, and interferon gamma are the four big nasty jerks that are responsible for the most negative side effects of the cytokine cascade um, as they signal. Uh, in, so inhibiting these cells then reduces significant inflammation, which would then alleviate symptoms and inhibit the viral spread, the V spread. So there's actually a whole list of herbs that are specific to inhibit specific cells. But again, in keeping this general, interferon gamma is at the top of the pyramid. Then comes tumor necrosis, tumor necrosis factor alpha. So it's kind of like this, interleukin-1 beta and interleukin-6. So if you want to get to the top of the pyramid, in, inhibiting interferon gamma, which is one of the cytokines, um, you can prevent that further cascade, right? So you can do that using cordyceps, 
Chinese skull cap, licorice, and it's important to note that licorice is a modulator. So it's not necessarily an inhibitor. So it doesn't always prevent. If your body was actually in a situation where it needed those things upregulated, it would help do that. Otherwise, it would help downregulate them. Now, again, I have studies for every one of these things that I'm talking about. Not to mention that all of this information came out of a book. So I'm not making it up. It, it has a reference. Um, but these are some of the studies that I have. So here's one about rhodiola. Here's one about cordyceps. Here's one about licorice. Um, cordyceps, astragalus. And, and so on. So I, I went on and specifically searched for articles about specific herbs in PubMed and what the activity of those herbs in studies had been shown to be. Okay. So obviously this author, the other books that I've referenced to get all of this information for you, um, they use these sources as well. Okay. So Ultimately, we know those are the big four bad ones. So how does this all translate? Well, basically, like we said, inhibition of these specific cytokines is crucial during pandemic strain infections. Uh, if the inflammation goes high enough in the lungs, it will go systemic, becomes sepsis, essentially. So whole body inflammation can lead to organ failure and cardiac arrest, which is what we're seeing in this recent infection. The other thing is that HMGB1, has specifically been identified in sepsis-induced cytokine storms, okay? So in the nastiest responses, in the most inflammation, when people have died of sepsis, they have always found this marker, okay, elevated. It also amplifies the response of all of the other bad guys, okay? So direct suppression, obviously, of HMGB1 is ideal. Okay, so again, angelica, salvia, licorice directly inactivate HMGB1 as well as EGCG inhibited and quercetin. Okay, now there are general things you can do, obviously, to we say strengthen, we're not going to say boost, I'll say it once, because of what's being associated with cytokine storms, we don't want to use the B word because that implies that we're upregulating as well. And people are now afraid to upregulate because of what they've read or heard about cytokine storms. So we're saying strengthen or modulate your immune system. Um, what we're using to do that, what I have seen in the literature is astragalus, cordyceps, and rhodiola. And that's more of what I have studies on today. These things increase resistance to stress. So they're okay to take prior to becoming infected if you think you are at risk or have been exposed. Um, they also all have mild anti-V activity, as we have talked about, in the sense that they may inhibit or interact with a certain mechanism along the way of how the virus gets in, finds a little house, seals off its little room, and starts to replicate itself, okay? So how does that all then translate over into our current issue with CV? Well, in CV, obviously the overall picture is similar to the flu and how it gets in, you know, the cells where it's uh, interfering, so on and so forth. The biggest difference is that unlike the flu, CV doesn't attach to sialic acid linkages. So some of those things like neuraminidase inhibitors, that is probably not going to work. Okay, I'm just, I'm making that association here because CV binds to a completely different cell. So it's probably doing it by a completely different method. Maybe, we don't know. I did, didn't get that far into it. But we know that it binds to ACE2. So if anybody knows anything about ACE2 receptors, you know that they are integral to our heart, our vascular cells, and our kidneys. They're involved in our renin-angiotensin system, which is important for blood pressure and breathing, and that they're crucial to most organs, but notably the spleen, the lungs, and the lymph node, which is where this damage occurs. So the CV that is infecting people now, it is binding to the ACE2 receptors and it is damaging the surfaces of the lung, the lymph, and the spleen, basically. That's where the immune system is, kind of. So again, there are specific botanicals 
that protect those organs, okay? So licorice, Chinese skull cap um, are a couple of them. And to some degree, they even help block the attachment. So ACE2 functions also tend to be less dynamic as people grow older. Coincidence? Um, hence the more negative side effects of CV and the elderly, okay? Um, and smokers and obese people because their lung function is already compromised. So uh, kudzu, salvia, and ginkgo have been shown to upregulate and protect the ACE2 expression and activity and lower angiotensin too. So ACE inhibitors increase the presence of ACE2 and help protect the lungs from injury. So my understanding with this is that the more ACE2 cells you have, the more opportunities the infection has, right? Does that make sense? So you want to protect this system. You can do that with Hawthorne and Kudzu, okay? It does, CV does have a similar cytokine pattern as the flu with high interferon gamma, interleukin-1 beta, tumor necrosis factor alpha, and interleukin-6, which interleukin-6 is the one with the RA drug that is very off-label experimental right now. There's also a few others, um, the RANTES uh, pathway, MCP1, and interleukin-8, they found were elevated in half of people infected with CV. Uh, so obviously, lowering these levels is important. And they found that specifically with CV that angelica and astragalus were helpful in lowering these levels. So again, we're not talking about treating the V. We're talking about addressing the levels of cells that are being affected by it, that are resulting in the inflammation and the symptoms that we're seeing. So again, the HMGB1 levels are high, especially in those who die from CV. So sharply reducing the interleukin-1 beta was found to decrease the impact of the disease on the infected and inhibit mortality. So again, specific uh, botanicals that do that, Chinese skullcap, cordyceps, and kudzu, okay? Excessive angiotensin II levels due to the destruction of ACE2 cells by the virus causes massive damage to the lung, lymph, and spleen. So again, coming back to protecting those cells from that damage. Um, protecting them specifically from hypoxia, we can use rhodiola. So that's why that one I think is in the astragalus cordyceps rhodiola sort of combination. Now, the virus does target and replicate in ciliated cells. So destroying those cells, if you don't know what cilia are, they're like little fingers on the cells and they sort of work like hands and feet. I don't know. They, they, I think of a centipede basically. So it helps them move around. So if they're ciliated cells, they can move around. But what happens is when you destroy those cells, those cells ability to move the mucus up and out of the lungs becomes destroyed as well, which is why all that stuff is in there. So again, you have to protect the cells of the lungs. You have to protect the ciliated cells. And again, you can do that with cordyceps, olive leaf, and berberine plants. Um, Autoantibodies are also produced, which attach to us, further increasing our de the destruction because we start attacking our own cells. So there's, again, reducing the autoimmune response, rhodiola, astragalus, and cordyceps, protecting the cells, the endothelial cells, um, Japanese knotwood or knotweed was crucial. And then again, coming back to protecting the spleen and the lymph is essential. Red root, poke root, and skull cap. So you can see some of these keep coming up, right? Like skull cap keeps coming up, cordyceps keeps coming up. So I don't think you have to do all of these things, um, especially if you're not you know, infected. These, these are things if you are concerned that you are infected, you haven't been confirmed yet, or you are just wanting to take extra precautions because you maybe have already got a cold and you just want things to keep working the way they should. Um, they did talk about some drugs, but again, nothing has been proven. So, you know, I don't know that conventional medicine pointing at us and saying, nothing natural has been proven when we can just point back and say, well, nothing conventional has been proven either. But they're seeing good results with natural treatment. So overall, the CV protocol, based on what worked with SARS, um, revolves a lot around the Chinese skullcap, 
um, and using something to inhibit the HMGB1, which comes down to Angelica, Salvia, and Kudzu, because Kudzu seems to be specific for the things that are affected by CV. So I ordered a few of these things. Many things are on back order, but I'm going to try to make myself um, a tincture of astragalus, cordyceps, and rhodiola, which is just in general to strengthen my body's response to how these things might affect it. Um, I'm not concerned that I'm infected. I'm not concerned anybody around me is infected. Um, but you know, people take echinacea and elderberry all the time. This is the one time I would consider taking something even though I'm not sick. Um, the thing you have to be careful about, which I wanted to touch on from a couple of other articles, is that taking something that upregulates some of these cytokines all the time is not necessarily a good idea. And that's where the whole elderberry um, what do you want to call it? Uh, it's not an argument, but discussion came about was because everybody was jumping on the elderberry train and then people started saying, well, don't you know, elderberry upregulates certain cytokines. And if your flu is really set in, it might be making it worse than helping it. So there's sort of a time and a place depending on where you're at in your infection. And so that's again, why you shouldn't just be going out willy nilly and treating yourself even with natural products. So, you know, you can do some things like probiotics, cod liver oil, vitamin C, vitamin D, very safe on your own, you know, not a lot to worry about in terms of, um, is it going to have any side effects? Is it going to interact with my medications? But if you get into the realm of messing around with botanical medicine, you want to be sure you're talking to somebody who knows something about it. They know something about how it works. They know something about what other drugs it could be interacting with, what botanicals it could be interacting with. Um, and from the studies that I have and the resources that I have, which, again, I spent a lot of time yesterday doing this. <sighs> Got my weight. These are all botanical medicine books. Right now, they're all on licorice. So I'm double checking that all of the licorice uh, resources that I have, I can check drug interactions, uh, dosage levels, and so forth, because there actually are two forms of licorice out there. Again, people probably don't know this who don't have a botanical medicine background. So it's important to look at these things and understand if you're taking deglycerinated licorice or you're taking regular licorice. So the problem with regular licorice is that it will and can interact with heart medications. It can cause hypertension and edema on its own with, in complication with these medications. Deglycerinated licorice was an attempt to remove the glycerin, which was the active compound in there, so that people didn't have to worry about that. So deglycerinated licorice is in all kinds of digestive health stuff because it's uh, mus mucinogenic, mucilaginous whatever. It protects the mucous membranes and helps your gut heal, basically. It's very protective. But once you add the glycerin back in, you get all the benefits of what we've been talking about today. But again, if you're someone who's taking any kind of heart medication, you shouldn't take regular licorice. It can be very dangerous. So that's the kind of stuff you want to be careful about. Um, just because I'm saying, oh, licorice is great. Again, I gave the disclaimer at the beginning of this talk. I am not giving medical advice. I'm providing education, okay? You should talk to a licensed, educated provider if you want to take advantage of these things to make sure they're okay. I'm going to come back to that at the end. I'm going to offer a service for that. But, um, so we were talking about the elderberry. Now, the article I found touched on the fact about a lot of the cytokine stuff. And Basically what he's saying is that upregulating the cytokines, just like we talked about, is sometimes beneficial, but not always. So you wouldn't want to necessarily upregulate um, interleukin-8, which is one of the ones we talked about is bad. Um, you can draw too many white blood cells to the lungs. This is a bad thing when you need the space for air. So basically the gist of the elderberry was if you're sort of using it as a preventative or you're at the beginning of the infection, great. If the, if the infection has set in, probably not the best idea to continue using it. Furthermore, um, talks about the fact that, uh, where was it? I loved it. It was a really good way of putting what I have said so, so many times. Um, the fact that if you are just taking it, here we go. If you are just using, using elderberries as a tonic when there is no V infection or complication, is it a big deal, right? People are like, oh, I take it all the time just for prevention. Um, there are some concerns about that because because excessive or persistent cytokine production results in a deregulated 
immune activation and plays a role in both the initiation and amplification phases of immunopathology. This means that a prolonged upregulation of these primary inflammatory cytokines could contribute to initiating or exacerbating an autoimmune disease specifically. So again, maybe this is more specific to people with an autoimmune disease or with a condition like rheumatoid arthritis where tumor necrosis factor alpha and interleukin-6 are already elevated and contributing to chronic inflammation. But there, again, are no human studies that have shown long-term use is safe. So I've always just gone by, and I've said it in other videos as well, the fact that if you don't need it right now, don't take it because it's like the boy who cried wolf and you want it to work when you need it. And he pretty much ends the article by saying that none of this is meant to say you should never use elderberry, but we're using this uh, article as an example to illustrate some of the questions you should be asking yourself about every single herbal product that you use. How does it work? When shouldn't a person use it? And are there safer alternatives? Okay. Um, and then at some point he also says, What's really frustrating is that there are plenty of herbs out there that interfere with viral repl replication, and the research right now is off the charts because people really are trying to research everything. Now, what that means for us in the future in terms of treatment, we have no idea. The point is, right now, we don't need elderberry. It's not the only option. And he says, why is the craze persisting? Call me cynical. It has to do with marketing. Okay, so again, it's not one of the primary things, but I've seen it come up many times, and I know there are lots of people out there taking elderberry every day, just something to be aware of. Another thing was vitamin C. I've been hearing a lot of people talking about high-dose vitamin C. There are reports coming out of China that they have had success treating CV with high-dose intravenous vitamin C. Now, that doesn't mean anything for the layperson at home because A, you're not going to be intravenously administering yourself vitamin C. And B, I highly doubt you will get your hands on the dosage amounts that you would need to do what they're doing, okay? Um, and I have another article, a reference for that. Um, vitamin C, one and a half grams given by IV every six hours, so a minimum of six grams total daily. And they were also giving it with hydrocortisone and thiamine. This was found to significantly decrease mortality and prevent progression of organ failure in patients with sepsis. Uh, the patients treated with the vitamin C protocol had an eight and a half percent death rate compared to 40% in the control group. There is currently a research trial underway to investigate vitamin C infusions for the treatment of severe CV infections and pneumonia, um, where the patients will receive 24 grams of vitamin C daily for seven days. Now, that doesn't mean there's no hope for it. You can get your hands on vitamin C. Vitamin C is great for everyone. It's water soluble which means you can't overdose on it. It's not gonna interact with anything. It's basically an antioxidant. Um, and you can take it up to ball tolerance. <laughs> that sounds gross. But what it means is that essentially, some people might be able to take two grams. Some people may be able to take five grams. Um, some people maybe are even taking 10 grams a day. So if you didn't know, um, 1,000 milligrams is one gram. So you can do the math there. So if your vitamin C tablets are 500 milligrams, two of those is one gram, okay? So we say divide the dose throughout the day. So if you want to take, you know, two tablets, uh, several times a day, great. When you start having diarrhea, back it off. So that's what we mean by bowel tolerance. Um, usually back it off whatever the last dose was that you had. So that's a very safe way to try to strengthen your immune system just by sort of flooding it with antioxidants, which are going to help sort of protect all of that, you know, bad stuff that could happen. A few other very quick notes uh, I have are, uh, I did share an article again because I think I put so many naughty words in it and naughty hashtags, it got severely downregulated because something I posted earlier that day had somewhere around 500 views and then this one had only like 190. So um, an important note here that if you have already gotten a flu vaccination, I said the word, you've already gotten the flu, um, or you uh, know someone who has, they are more at risk for a CV infection, okay? Here's the two studies. You can look them up. They're on PubMed. Influenza V, uh, increased risk of a non-influenza V respiratory infection. This one in particular is the one that I think is circulating the most on the internet right now from 
about two years ago, initially done on personnel in the Department of Defense. So uh, V-derived V interference was significantly associated with CV and human metapneumonia virus um, infections. So the percentage that they're coming up with is about 36%. But again, that doesn't surprise me that the elderly, immune compromised, those with underlying health conditions are the first populations to jump up and get a flu V. And now they're the ones most affected by the CV infection. So things that you should be aware of that could increase your susceptibility and or don't rush out and get one. It's not going to have any effect on the current infection that we're experiencing. So those are two articles from PubMed. There's also another article circulating right now. I looked it up. PubMed, March 5th, 2020. Potential false positives. Super. So as I talked about last week, it's a good thing that we're testing more. We want more accurate numbers because for every case that we get confirmed where someone resolves, it brings our mortality rate down. It makes this a much less scary and deadly infection. However, March 5th, this was not quite two weeks ago, in China, what they said was they had about an 80% false positive rate of positive results among the asymptomatic infected individual. I don't... I mean, that some of this is a little wordy. Um, they talk about close, in conclusion, close contacts of CV-19 patients. Nearly half or even more of the asymptomatic infected individuals reported in the active nucleic acid test screening might be false positives. So this is regarding the nucleic acid test. And I know that's another concern right now because they're trying to come out with better test methods. So who knows if this is one we're using here, um, but I think this would be important to know, right? Because if you have symptoms and you go in and get tested, you want to know what tests they're giving you so you know what your chances are of having a false positive. That also stinks because then for every positive that we get and someone gets better, that's inaccurate stats for us to put back against the mortality rates. Um, so those are those studies. So overall, to summarize, um, obviously, continue washing hands for at least 20 seconds. The soap disrupts the fatty lipid membrane on the virus, the V, which prevents it from binding. Obviously, the social distancing, these two things remain our two best ways to limit the spread right now until we get a better handle on it. Eat healthy. Know your food intolerances. If you don't already know them, this would be a fantastic time to find out. We know that eating your food intolerances creates a state of chronic underlying inflammation in your body. And if you want your immune system to be working top notch, you don't want it to be inhibited by this other junk that's coming from what you're eating. So um, I know a lot of people are doing smoothies or sharing their juicy, juicing recipes online to, you know, get lots of good nutrients in like things that come from the ginger and lemon, you get the citrus and the bioflavonoids and, and all the antioxidants that, you know, you're, you're getting from vitamin C. Those are all great options. On a personal, in my house, we have our molecule air filter running all the time which is shown to kill viral particles. We have diffusers uh, in every room with some sort of combination with essential oil like thyme, eucalyptus, rosemary, sage. Um, I know there's combination products out there against like germies and there's thieves if you're a young living person. Um, plant therapy has an immunate, immunate whatever. Um, we're doing probiotics, cod liver oil, vitamin D and C. And as I said, I'm going to start my astragalus, rhodiola, and cordyceps as soon as I actually get the products. So um, again, we're talking about immune strengthening. I have a sheet that I'm working on. It's not perfect yet, but this is what I want to start sharing is my sort of protocol for strengthening your body for V infections. And I, again, I had to tweak it. I got to make sure there's really nothing on here that is naughty or is going to get me in trouble. Um, but as, as you can see, the first four are what I said I'm already taking. The next three are those three specific herbals and then two more and then the licorice. But again, the note has to be made about licorice that you can't just go take that on your own if you're taking any kind of heart medication. Again, this is all for education. I am not telling you to do this. If you want to do this, I am open for business. I have always offered telehealth as a service. My electronic health record system is HIPAA compliant and has HIPAA compliant video chatting built into it. So we can have appointments by phone or video. 
I can't do physical exams on people anyways in Wisconsin, so you are not missing out or getting any less of a visit or quality of care with me if we do something online or over the phone than if you come into the office. It's just us talking. If you have concerns about starting or wanting to start any of the things we've talked about today, what I have created is a $99, 45-minute wellness chat. So it will be a very small abbreviated intake where I can get your health history, what medications you're taking, and help you make uh, appropriate recommendations if there's anything that you would like to try to incorporate into your regimen to further strengthen your body's responses to potential infections, okay? Um, I also have a new category, I should say the category is still the same on my online dispensary. If you're like, yeah, whatever, I don't care. I'm just gonna do what I want myself. Um, my full script online dispensary has a category for immune support. All options of the kinds of products we talked about today are in there. I'll warn you about 90% of the stuff is back ordered. So it's gonna be tricky. Really at this point, I think a lot of this information is circulating whether people are putting it online or not. And um, people are getting, the, the stocks are depleted. They're, they're getting order, uh, back ordered at this point already. So that's everything for today. Wow, 50 minutes. Huh, that was a lot of information. So I have multiple sources, as I said. Uh, you know, this is an article about astragalus, um, widely used in Chinese medicine for the treatment of uh, bee and bacterial infections and inflammation attributed to its antioxidant, anti-inflammatory, anti-apoptotic properties. It specifically notes where I highlighted all the signaling pathways that are inhibited, um, including the NF-kappa beta, which we talked about. Um, astragalus uh, helps particularly the body resist V infections in the lungs. Uh, researchers at the University of Texas found that astragalus um, elevated the cell-destroying abilities of the immune system through interleukin-2, so that was a, a good one. However, the body can develop a tolerance to immune strengthening herbs like astragalus if it is taken for too long of a period. And again, may interact with medications that are suppressing the immune system. So if you're on immune suppressive medications to begin with, this is something you might want to not do as well. So again, important to talk to someone who knows about this stuff. Um, this article on cordyceps talks about specifically um, anti-inflammatory and antibacterial properties, an important source of treating various disorders, uh, da, 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 35 species, anti-HIV, there's so much information. Um, here's one on rhodiola, uh, golden root, a wholesome treat of immunity. <laughs> um, Long history of use as a medicinal plant, boosting immunity, increasing energy. It's an adaptogenic herb, um, helps the body adapt and resist to stress. Overall conclusion is that rhodiola has immense therapeutic potential and hence uh, this review would give impetus to new research for the development of nutraceuticals. Another one, specifically in humans uh, with depressive symptoms, two randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trials overall Results of these studies suggest a possible antidepressant action um, in contrast to conventional depressants, well-tolerated in short term, et cetera, et cetera. Multi-target effects on various levels of regulation to cell response. Um, this one was on licorice here, specifically right here, highlighted. Regular herbs used in traditional Chinese medicine, many effects on the immune system, anti-inflammatory, anti-immune regulatory, in bold, antiviral and anti-tumor effects, okay? So there are studies out there, if you go looking for them, that you can find. Um, specifically, again, uh, interfering with NF-kappa beta. This is one on the Chinese skullcap, scutellaria. And this one, again, widely used in China for a treatment of various diseases against Coxsackie virus is what it was studied. So we know it has viral activity. Again, down here, highlighted, starred, and they put it in bold, not me. Our study indicated that this is a promising but potent antiviral agent. Now, again, this was specifically studied against Coxsackie virus, but overall, it's, an, it's not, we know that these things aren't necessarily viral specific. They're specific to the way the V's get in and replicate in our body. So right here, by inhibition of V replication by depressing the AKT and P38 pathways. So that's, that's exactly what we've been talking about today. So I'm going to 
list all of these evidence-based uh, sources with the post today in the comments. And if you want copies um, of either my notes or this at a glance sheet, um, as soon as I put the final touches on it, you let me know. So thank you for joining me today. Uh, if you have any other questions, let me know. Uh, I think I've given you just about all of the information. And um, we'll see, we'll continue to see how this involves. If there's more information to share on this topic next week, we'll continue to try to share it in the most general way possible. But please share this information with your friends and family. This is important stuff that is not in the media because it's just not widely accepted enough, okay? There's, there's not enough, I shouldn't go down the political ramp. Okay, please share. There are nice, easy, safe ways that you can protect yourself and your family members with this information today. It's educational. I'm not giving you direct medical advice. If you want professional advice, please set up an appointment with me, telehealth. I have lots of availability now. All right, thank you for joining me today, and I will see you all next week for another Wellness Wednesday. Have a great afternoon.